So in this video, we will be discussing another very common mistake when it comes to trying to predict stocks. Before we begin this lecture, I want to start by telling you why this video exists. Perhaps you believe this sounds like kind of a random topic, but in fact, it's not. In the past 10 years, machine learning has become a very popular subject. Colleges and universities have added many new courses and many new instructors to fill the demand. They've even created new degrees in data science and analytics. The point is, many new people are getting into machine learning, and many people are asking the questions I'm about to address. What we quickly learn when we start to dive into machine learning is that it can be used to predict things. It can predict all kinds of things. It can predict what object is inside a photo. It can predict whether or not a customer has made a fraudulent transaction. It can predict your state of mind using only readings of your brain waves. So a natural question to ask is, can it predict the future? Well, we know that machine learning can be used for time series forecasting. For example, it can be used to forecast your sales over the next quarter or your CPU usage for the next week. Well, are stock prices not also a time series? The answer is yes, stock prices are most certainly a time series. So your next idea is not only obvious, but also not uncommon. In fact, I'm underplaying this quite a bit. The idea of using machine learning to predict stock prices is actually very common. The problem is, it's not very common amongst the leaders in the field, those who are pushing the boundaries of machine learning in applications like computer vision, self-driving, and natural language. Where it is common is with bloggers and online courses. This should be your first hint that something is fishy about this. You see, most bloggers and GitHub account owners are not really interested in science or math. What they are interested in is getting you to read their blog. So what better way than to write about a topic which everyone is easily attracted to when they first hear about machine learning and how it can be used to make very accurate predictions. Unfortunately, what this leads to is a lot of low effort content. These bloggers don't really write code. They mostly copy code from other people. Unfortunately, the people who wrote the original code made mistakes and these mistakes propagated because no one ever bothered to check whether or not the code actually works. Another unfortunate fact is that, aside from blogs, this kind of garbage content pervades online courses as well, especially those that can be found on Udemy. So that is why I'm making these videos. If you are a serious data scientist, I don't want you to be a victim of this bad content. When you're still learning, it's easy to be fooled because you trust your instructor to be honest. You trust your instructor to teach you the right things. You often can't tell the difference between legitimate and illegitimate uses of machine learning. You might even include these bad examples on your GitHub or your resume, which will work against you when you apply for jobs. Now, you may be thinking, I don't care about getting a job. I'm going to use this code to play the stock market and make millions of dollars. This is where you have to think logically. If this code actually worked, you should ask yourself whether these people would be posting it on their blogs or simply using it to make money and not telling anyone else. The fact is, these approaches do not work for various reasons which have been outlined in this video series. In other words, it's important to help those who are eager about machine learning by making them aware of those who are trying to fool them with this illegitimate content. Okay, so this video is actually part of a series since the mistakes involved in predicting stocks are so numerous that I can't fit them all into a single video. This particular video is about using prices as inputs into your machine learning model. At first, it might sound like I'm wrong. You might think prices are what make up a time series. Why shouldn't prices be used as inputs? There are two main concepts I want to discuss in this video, which are stationarity and extrapolation. Once you understand these two concepts, it should be obvious why using prices as inputs is not a good idea. Now, before we continue on with this lecture, this is just a short reminder that I now have four VIP courses, which have limited time discount coupons. As of this video, the current discount coupons are set to expire in just one week. You can get the coupons by using the links in the description below. Okay, so if you're watching this video, you're probably interested in time series analysis. This is my latest course released just a few weeks ago. It covers classic methods such as ETS and ARIMA, but also modern methods like machine learning and deep neural networks. 
Now, if you're interested in time series analysis, you're probably also interested in financial time series. In my financial engineering course, we not only cover financial time series, but also how to build an optimal portfolio and how to trade using algorithmic rules. If you tend to trade in the stock market using your emotions rather than science, this course is for you. Now, it turns out that there is a whole field of study devoted to learning these algorithmic rules such that you can maximize your reward. This is the field of reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning also happens to be very closely connected to control theory, which as you'll see, is sort of like a cousin to time series analysis. The final VIP course I want to mention is my PyTorch course. Now, I probably don't have to tell you this, but deep learning is one of the most important topics in data science nowadays. The preferred library used by most leading companies and research labs is PyTorch. TensorFlow used to be cool, but its popularity has decreased over the years. Okay, so again, these coupons expire in less than one week. You can find the VIP links in the description below. Now, importantly, if you watch this video too late, you may still have a chance to get the VIP coupons. So check the links in the description to see if there are any updates. Okay, so let's consider the concept of stationarity. At a high level, stationarity means the distribution of the points in your time series does not change over time. There is a weaker version of this called weak sense stationarity, which simply means that the mean and variance do not change over time. So as an example, consider a time series with a trend, such as the S&P. In this case, the mean changes over time, and thus, it is considered non-stationary. Consider another time series where the variance changes over time. This is also non-stationary. Okay, so why do we care about stationarity when we're trying to model time series? Well, suppose we have a simple linear autoregression. Let's say y of t is equal to 0.5 y of t minus 1 minus 0.2 y of t minus 2. Although for the purpose of this discussion, it doesn't really matter what this expression is. Now, what makes this a good model for our time series? Well, this would be a good model if it can help us make accurate predictions. But suppose this is only accurate for certain values of t. In that case, this model is no good because it cannot be used for other values of t. That is why we require stationarity. If the data is not stationary, then this relationship could change with t, which may make the model obsolete for the time period we actually want to use it. In fact, note that this concept of stationarity applies to areas outside of time series as well, although we don't typically think of it as stationarity. Instead, consider that your data comes from some distribution. A neural network learns p of y given x, that is, the probability for the target y given the input x. Suppose, for example, we are building a classifier that can tell apart images of cats and dogs. Suppose that all the cats are white and all the dogs are black. So that should give you some idea of the distribution of the training set, that is, p of x or p of x given y. Now, suppose that for the test set, the situation is reversed. All the dogs are white and all the cats are black. Now what will happen to our model? Well, it's probably not going to do very well. Why? Because the distribution of the data has changed. So if you think about this in terms of time series, it should be clear why you do not want the distribution of your data to change from train to test. Your model simply hasn't learned what to do in those different scenarios. Now, you may reject the idea of stationarity. Suppose that your model is more powerful than just a linear autoregression. Suppose you're using an LSTM that has the power to remember many different kinds of sequences at once, perhaps with different kinds of relationships between the input and the output, and you just feed your model lots of data such that it has seen everything that could possibly happen in the stock market. Well, we still have another problem to contend with. This is the problem of extrapolation. So why does the concept of extrapolation matter if you are trying to predict stock prices from past stock prices? Well, let's look at the price of the S&P from March 2020 up to October 2021. Suppose that our training set was from March 2020 up to March 2021. In this period, the price of the S&P ranged from about $250 to about $400. Now, suppose that we would have liked to forecast from April 2021 up to October 2021. 
In this period, the price of the S&P ranged from about $400 to $450. So you might be wondering, why is this an issue? The reason this is an issue is because you're asking your model to make predictions when your inputs are outside of the range of values it was trained on. But, you might say, is this not exactly what machine learning is supposed to do? You might say it's supposed to be good at making predictions on examples it has never seen before. Unfortunately, this is a subtle but different issue. In my latest course on time series analysis, we analyze ourselves, how different models extrapolate. We look at all kinds of models, from support vector machines, to the random forest, to neural networks. What we found was that, in all these cases, these models fail to extrapolate, even for simple patterns. Furthermore, they all extrapolate in different ways. So, for example, the random forest tends to extrapolate by going horizontally outward. This is due to the nature of decision trees on which the random forest is based. Whereas the neural network tends to extrapolate linearly. So this is not a matter of philosophy. It's not a matter of what you believe these machine learning models should be able to do. We have seen firsthand what they actually do. The fact is, how the model extrapolates is more based on the form of the model rather than the patterns in the dataset. Now, there's one mistake which some beginners believe will solve this issue. This is to normalize the data so that it falls into a small range of values, like between 0 and 1. Unfortunately, this does absolutely nothing because all the values are scaled by the same factor. So suppose we're using the S&P once again, and you scale down your values so that the train set goes from 0.25 up to 0.4. Correspondingly, the test set would go from 0.4 up to 0.45. Thus, the test set is still outside the range of the train set, and nothing has changed. So what is the solution to this issue? The solution is to make your time series stationary using techniques such as those taught in my latest course on time series analysis. If you like this video, don't forget to click the like button and subscribe if you haven't already done so. Thanks for listening and I'll see you in the next lecture.